She thumps a cane and drinks champagne She's formidable and judgmental But we can guarantee That she's a quintessential lady D But recognizes great potential What would Danbury do? Welcome to What Would Danbury Do? Your guide to Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series from A to V Bridgerton goes full shock and awe in episode two as Simon, Will, and Anthony all follow Daphne's lead and throw a few punches around. Eloise and Penelope seek the answers to one of life's big questions, and we learn that Lady Danbury is, in fact, the greatest, and we will broker no arguments. It's time to tune into Bridgerton season one, episode two, Shock and Delight. Don't forget you can find us on Twitter and Facebook at Bridgerton Pod and Instagram at WWDDPod, and join the conversation using the hashtag WWDDPod. Hi, I'm Adele. Oh, oh, going in for the kill. I'm Rudy. The dog's breakfast already. He threw off the rhythm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kate. Multiple flashbacks to Simon's childhood show his traumatic birth, the abuse meted out by his father, the physical disability that he worked to hide, and how Lady Danbury saves him. Daphne and Simon's charade is an instant success, making the pages of Whistledown an infuriating Anthony, who accepts Lord Burbrick's proposal on Daphne's behalf. Penelope and Marina become closer. Violet comes up with an idea to save Daphne from marriage to Burbrick and implements it with great success. This episode features discussions on reproduction, secret smoking buddies, an ugly threat, and a very suggestive buttoning of a glove. And we should also mention that this episode comes with content warnings for traumatic birth episodes and child abuse, both on screen and discussed. It's a cold open on the birth of Simon, and it's like a very traumatic birth and is very definitely death of Simon's mother? Yeah, well, she, I mean, she, yeah. it's very clear she dies shortly after the birth. We go from that really, like, intense cold open straight into the column from Lady Whistledon that effectively tells us Simon and Daphne's plan from the previous episode is working and everyone is fooled and that they are now going to promenade and negotiate the terms of their deal of like fake dating. They're working super well, hard I mean, to make Simon rakish, aren't they? Like he rolls out of bed half naked from one woman, like throws on a shirt and shows up at Daphne's promenade. Like, especially because that is the first time that I've seen that we've seen him having some kind of, I guess, like gesture to him being someone who has sex and, and is rakish. And then, like, doesn't come up again the rest of the episode. <laughs> no. Look, I think what they're doing is they're providing an incredibly sanitized version of a rake. So we see Simon sort of roll out of bed. And then he does things like when they're promenading and she's like, you know, you should be courting me. And he says, you know, if I were courting you, I would only need five minutes alone with you in the drawing room. With the promenade, it is so delightful to see... Lady Danbury and Violet plotting, whilst also bragging about their children, quote unquote. And they are having fun, but they are genuinely excited to sort of be family. And it certainly sets up a contrast between like the way that Violet and Lady Danbury get along versus the way that Violet and is Nigel Burbrick's mother a lady as well? Yes, lady she Burbrook. is. Lady Burbrook. Later on and there's almost a parallel relationship there between how well Simon and Daphne gel with each other versus Daphne and Nigel. And then how easily Lady Danbury and Violet gel with each other versus Violet and Lady Burbrook. There's also the, we have Simon and Daphne promenading whilst negotiating the whole time, which is kind of like soft foreplay, really. It's setting them up as not just friends but a team like they are working to a common goal and there's something really delightful about that I think that for me that's why fake dating is a trope that I really love like it is that thing of we know something that no one else knows we are keeping this secret together makes an immediate twosome even if it's not the kind of twosome that they expect 
There is one tiny thing that I just want to flag. So book Simon is the one who thinks to bring flowers for both Daphne and Violet when he visits. Netflix Simon is told by Daphne he has to bring flowers for herself and her mother. It's the slightest change, but it's one that really kind of changes the dynamic of their relationship potentially. Yeah, it's interesting because in the book it was it was a sign of Simon's thoughtfulness and it was sort of the first step to falling in love with him is to, you know, seeing that his courtesy and that he was willing to do things that didn't necessarily need to be done, but because they were nice things to do. Being told to do that. And I mean, he did follow through, which is nice, but it it takes some of the responsibility away from Simon for making, I guess, the viewers fall in love with him. For me, what it is, is that it says that Daphne is potentially going to be the one who takes the lead, pushing them forward in every capacity, which like possibly that's the goal and it gives her more autonomy in it. But yeah, actually, I like that a lot. And it makes a lot of sense too, particularly in this episode where we see sort of the, the origins of Simon's distance from everybody and everything around him. Also, how dare they rob us of a scene when Violet receives the flowers? Because she is a full Simon stan pretty much from the beginning. And that would help show why. Okay, do we think that Violet is a Simon stan? Or do we think that Violet is a dukedom stan? I think that she just loves a dukedom. I've been side-eyeing her since her conversation with Anthony in the previous episode. Violet fell in love with her husband pretty much like this. They got married like this. They had babies like this. Like in the book verse of Violet and Edmund, right? I think she saw them dancing at Vauxhall and just went, like, created the romantic picture in her head. Mm. I think you're clouded by book Violet. <laughs> yeah, I do too. <laughs> I think that you're being sentimental. I think Screen Violet is a social climber. You said I was sentimental. When the fuck am I ever sentimental? Right now. Now. (laughs) Let's move on to one of the most incredible running jokes that this episode has. Penelope starts to figure out babies can be made out of wedlock. My favorite scene in the whole episode, and I really liked this episode, so it's hard to say which my favorite scene is, but oh my god, when the two of them think that Penelope and Eloise is catching, and Eloise is like, well, you have to figure it out so it doesn't happen to us. I just, I like, rewound and like watched that scene like four or five times in a row because it's just so, the actress who's playing Eloise is so perfect, and I love her so much, and I just... She jumps off the screen. She's so fantastic. I know we got on the Penelope's ship during the books, but this is the episode. As Eloise and Penelope walk down the street discussing where babies come from, and Eloise with her fringe that looks like she cut it herself in isolation. Like, I just, everything about that, I was like, oh, there are a couple... Just, I just want her to be able to go to university and date Penelope and just just have a great time. Just, You're like the Regency like, version of the like popular slash wallflower YA romance. What kind of popular girl is Eloise? She's the popular girl who is popular because she's so fully and thoroughly herself. And literally gives no fucks about what anybody thinks of her. She's the girl with the leather jacket who smokes in the bathroom is slightly intimidating, but also reads all the books and knows all the answers in English. Mm. See, I thought maybe she was like the jock. Yeah, I sort of had a jock feeling, but I don't think that Eloise is a particularly active. I think she plays lacrosse. (laughs) (laughs) I don't really know what lacrosse is, but I think she plays it. Lacrosse is Canada's national sport. Is feeding my imagination, but the show's not going to go there, right? 
having Eloise like go to university and play lacrosse and fall in love with Penelope? Maybe not. No, I would love it if they deviate from Eloise's story longer term and they do something new and different. I just think they have taken the gayest character in the books and cast the gayest actress in that show. And I don't understand. Surely they know what they've done. <laughs> but it's this pose that she does, the, how does a lady come to be with child? She's, oh. she's going to win awards. Also, the <laughs> way she sits between her brothers and sort of punches them in a weird, like, downward trajectory. And it's so, it's, it tells you a lot about the relationship between siblings. Like, it just shows you it. And also Daphne's curiosity, like, oh, but this is information yeah. I should know. Like, I want to listen in on this. I just really love Colin trolling Violet. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go get our six cent Violet's expression is amazing. Oh, everything about this whole storyline is perfection and it just makes me happy just even talking about it. It's not such just a... Not oh. <laughs> so they get rid of Francesca because they say she's practicing pianoforte with Aunt Winnie. In Bath. Because I am fully committed to this podcast and the work that we're doing, I went looking to see if Aunt Winnie exists anywhere. She's not in the Rokesbury series, so she mustn't be on... Wait, she's invented. Yeah, she mustn't be on Edmund's side. That's what I was going to say. She might be Violet's sister. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we talk about... This plot works and all these gentlemen end up in the drawing room of the Bridgerton's house. And then Anthony turns up with Burbrook and then puts his hands on at least three footmen on the way up to the room. I know. Just, and that's oh. not Anthony that I know. I mean, I know that he's like, I don't know, feels out of control and is trying to assert his, his right and manhood and whatever and I was just like I'm exhausted by this I mean it just it made me think about Adele's point despite the fact that Antony is a viscount and very much should know and be following the rules of good society he's really unconcerned about like shoving people shooing them out of the room in like the rudest possible way there's no way they cleared that room without him being like an absolute bore. Like, <laughs> like boy has no fucks to give about his reputation, but that has repercussions for the whole family as well. Like, I wonder if part of his thinking is like, well, by the time they have any actual power, because a lot of them probably don't have a title yet because they would be waiting for yeah. their own fathers to die. He has a title, though, so he's like, whatever. He's definitely convinced himself he's doing this for Daphne's good. Like, there's no shred of, like, uncertainty in him. Like, Burbrook's the right choice. He's vetted everybody else. He, like, Simon's his mate, but Simon's also a fuckboy. No. So I think he... Also, he has to marry off seven siblings. Like it's a it's a patriarchy. He's only really having to worry about the girls. <laughs> and I mean, to but be yeah. fair to Anthony, like Simon is a fuck boy, and he yeah. has told Anthony, you know, quite clearly, I'm never going to marry and and whatever. And I'm not saying that like Nigel was the right choice, but he, you know, he's not wrong in in thinking that Simon is the wrong choice. He doesn't know that we're in a romance novel yet, so he doesn't yeah. know that. Um, Time is going to come good in the end. I guess the thing for me, though, is that, like, even if he believes that the problem is Simon is not good enough for his sister, he's shooed out an entire drawing room of other eligible men. And they can't all be poets. Yeah. It's, no, but it's, it's, so su like, it's such clear emotional immaturity. Like, he made a decision and he told his mother and his sister of his decision and now they're defying him and he can't possibly like think about that or or you know go back on what he has decided like he is the head of the household and they have to listen to him and it's just it's just him it's just his emotional immaturity just played out large for everybody to see he's wearing 
all of his feelings on the outside and thinking that he's somehow the man of the house while doing it. Like, he's just so misguided. Sorry. Anthony is not terrifically self-aware, but the thing is, his sister Eloise is supposed to come out next season. A lot of those chaps in that room might be still available next year. I think we can just summarize Anthony in this whole episode as he doesn't think. (laughs) If family is so important to Anthony, then why the hell is he signing up for a lifetime of, like, family dinners with Nigel Burbrick? Like, surely he should be thinking about the family as including him and having to, like, deal with that. I think that's a that's a question that Book Anthony has a really good answer for, but like yeah, right. I don't I know I don't that. know if that's something that's going to carry through. Mm. They have to be changing that. There's no way they can go into season two following the Viscount who loved me now. With a with big that. family he motto. But I think they are because I watched a behind the scenes thing Nicola Coughlin was talking about how butterflies are the mascot for the Featheringtons. You think it'd be a bird? No, butterfly makes sense. Can we just talk about how Simon's childhood lands a bit differently with the casting of black actors to play Simon's childhood and uh, Roger? There's also the Duke telling one of the younger versions of Simon to remain extraordinary. Yeah. So they can be, continue to be recipients of the ducal line. It is a, I guess, an inkling of what the alternative history of this universe is. But it also, for me, references another Shonda Rhimes show, Scandal, where the heroine of that show is told by her father that, that you know, you always need to be, more brilliant as a person of colour just to be seen. Like, you have to be exceptional. And that's not an accident. This is one of those things where, like, when it was announced that the series was going to have racially blind casting, or they've called it, like, race conscious or something like that, but, like, when they decided that they effectively were going to race bend characters... And they said that Simon was going to be one of those characters. I initially thought that it would be that Simon has a white father and a black mother and that that was part of their tension and dynamic. And so seeing that he not only had a black father but a father that had darker skin than his mother was the first time that I thought oh, this series is not going to deal with race well. They're going to do something that's going to be deeply uncomfortable. I wish that they had have either gone for a logical real-world explanation or just ignored, like, the implications of the racial dynamics because there is no way to make a peerage an equitable and just society. Like, that's not like, fundamentally, <laughs> like, that, that's, that's a fundamental kind of disconnect. But, like, oh, it's a fucking mess. And it's something that it, it's not something that we can cover quickly. At one point we get this conversation with Danbury after seeing the death of her friend. A few years later, Simon hasn't had a relationship with her she hasn't been able to see him she basically bursts her way into Cliveden and sort of declares herself to Simon to find out he's quite accomplished but he also stammers and she barely blinks and gives him this incredible speech when I was a girl some centuries ago I was afraid even of my own reflection I entered a room and attempted to dissolve into the shadows But there is only so long when in a position such as ours can hide. I knew I would have to step into the light someday, and I could not very well be frightened. So, instead, I made myself frightening. I sharpened my wit, my wardrobe, and my eye, and I made myself the most terrifying creature in any room I entered. You can speak. I understood you well enough. 
and I will help you to overcome this stammer of yours. But in exchange, you must promise me that when you step into the light, you will be worthy of the attention you command. If you didn't already love Lady Danbury, I think you would have been won over by that scene. One of the so one of the problems with this episode is that it gives us a taste of the idea of how race works in the series, but it hasn't fully explained it yet. But I hope that we remember to come back to this moment when we find the full explanation, because it's actually really heartbreaking to watch it and understand her life. In, in how excited we are by that scene, though, we have skipped over my actual genuine most favourite scene. We've we brushed past. It's fucking glorious, though. Penelope brings cake to Marina and asks her how she became pregnant. And Marina tells cake. her cake. And then and she then does... Penelope's face. Like, it's just, it's comedy gold. Like, it's so funny. <laughs> like, you read everything that Penelope is thinking in that moment. Like, this cake is really good, but it might make me pregnant. I don't know what to do right now. Also, cake, how much cake have I eaten in my life? The other scene that we skipped over that I was really interested in, Lady Danbury and Simon have a discussion about how Simon should wear more colour, like his outfits are too austere and it is just the tiniest little nod to the fact that men's fashion is about to get real conservative in the next few years because Simon's kind of boring outfit is all the rage or whatever it is that he says. He's referencing the dude that I've forgotten the name of who popularised the idea of men not wearing colourful clothes and not wearing like clothes that had intricate designs and and prettiness are you talking about Beau Brummel that's exactly who I mean thank you it like this show does this really up. interesting kind of thing where it like it like will give you these tiny moments of historical accuracy or reference so that you take it seriously but like it is also in terms of historical accuracy, like an absolute fucking mess. And, you know, if there's one thing that pisses, like, historical accuracy assholes off, it's hairstyles. Like, who gives a fucking shit? But anyway. Yeah, so we have another dance. And they have that beautiful dance scene where they're really, like, happy and joyful and they keep their faces come closer together and then further apart and closer together and they're smiling and I just my heart sang with joy. And they're dancing to Sean Mendes in my blood. No, that that is later. later. Um, oh it is. It is because I looked it up. It's called Simon and Lady Danbury. Because the I liked it so much I shazammed it in the middle of the <laughs> I liked it so much I thought it was a pop song that I didn't recognize. Yeah, same one hundred percent because because I have young kids, like I way out of pop, what's popular at the moment. So I same I thought it was a pop song that I didn't recognize, so I shazammed it and it turns out no, it's original composition, it's called Simon and Lady Danbury, and it was delightful. And then um you see Anthony bullying Benedict into dancing with Daphne, which is a nice little sibling interplay. But you have that interplay with Anthony, Simon, and then Nigel coming in where Anthony is so sure Burbrook is the right person until Simon drops, what, what, three separate hints (laughs) that are getting more and more (laughs) obvious. But the thing is, other than asking why... Daphne would have said something he takes Simon at his word even though he says Simon would be a terrible influence terrible choice for Daphne it still is friend saying this person is not deserving of your sister he's not a good guy and immediately is like you're done Anthony's like she would have told me and Simon's like eyebrow raise eyebrow yeah (laughs) and Anthony's like oh, crap. And then later on, Daphne's like, yeah, because you wouldn't believe me, but you'll believe a man. I also love Daphne saying to Simon, basically, like, I don't need your help. 
I've got this sorted. You were not aware of what was happening around that conversation in the room. You actually have left me in a precarious situation. It's more that you don't realise how unsafe Nigel Burbrook actually is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you as someone with more power can absolutely take him on, but I'm not in that position and you've just pointed him at me. Well, she uses a really good word because she says his entitlement that's a really loaded word, but it's also, it's a perfect word to describe how Nigel feels about Daphne. And we're going to see that play out a little bit later in the episode. This is where like, it becomes again, one of those things where immediately after being told by Daphne to beware of how he interacts with Burbrook, He's goaded into it, but Simon ends up beating up Burbrook quite badly. And I'm wondering if this is there as a sign that when Simon is in moments of extreme stress, upset, anger, he is physically powerful enough to do something about that. Mm. And that's just a thought that I want to put on the table and we don't need to discuss any further, really. It just, it's a thought I want to, we will come back to Mm. eventually. But like, Mm. we We literally go from this scene into another flashback and it's where baby Simon speaks and Mm. speaks to his father for the first time. That's a very deliberate choice to me. He might not be good with his words, but he's good with his action. Also, because Book Simon was not particularly verbal with anybody but the people he's super comfortable with. One of the reasons that people take notice of him and listen to him even before he had a dukedom was that he so rarely spoke that he must have meant what he said at the times that he said them. So he would cut people with like a word by being like, no, or stop, or (laughs) simply turning and walking away without saying a single word. Oh my God, I love that about book Simon. I think they did that a little bit with um, screen Simon because they did it with his eyebrow. Like that man's eyebrow does a lot of heavy lifting (laughs) in this series. (laughs) <laughs> when Peter Capaldi was the doctor in Doctor Who, apparently his scripts used to come with eyebrow notes. And I really wonder if that's <laughs> if that's happening here. <laughs> well, I do think the interesting thing about the actor is his voice is naturally higher. So Aww. I just saw him in Sylvie's Love, which is... Uh, like a really lovely historical romance movie featuring a black cast and his voice naturally is quite a lot higher if you've heard it in interviews or the role that he plays in that movie so yeah purely from a discursive point of view it makes me sad that he has dropped his voice to be a romantic lead I don't like that I would love to know if that was a choice that he made anyway the picnic. Um, That's what my right. in my notes I just wrote picnic exclamation point. Anthony being a reasonably good father figure. And I was like oh, with, oh. with the sibling yeah, the baby sibling. With the babies. He's playing some kind of weird hoop game with them, but he's all like engaged and like making them laugh. And I was like, Anthony Ugh. But also he is a little hurt that Daphne didn't confide in him. Well, maybe he should sit the fuck down with those feelings for a second and think about why instead of splashing well, well, you know his feelings. I'm, I'm going to become an Anthony apologist, I guess, because <laughs> I'm actually listening to the book again at the moment. He has that laser focus, which is not great, but he clearly gives a shit. So, like, I'm going to give him points for that. But we have Burbrook storm up with his face don't a jump mess. too far ahead take oh, this a little right. bit I'll slower there's a cuff that's that needs to be buttoned Adele <laughs> I mean Daphne knows what she's doing she knows how to play the game it wasn't her idea to play the game in the first place but like she is surpassing Simon on the rules of this game but she's also managed she can manage him as we discussed with the flowers 
like it is setting up the way that the relationship is going to work through the next of the series. Like Daphne is always going to be at least one step ahead of Simon emotionally and in their relationship. And thus she, like she's going to have to trailblaze for him so that he has a path to follow. And the question is, when does he start following the path willingly? I think it shows that Daphne has a better understanding of perception than Simon has ever cared to have because he He doesn't doesn't need to. to. He can just show up on horseback with that rakish lean that he's got and his rakishly open collar and his, you know, (laughs) oh my goodness, rakish diffident attitude and nobody blinks an eye. Everybody sort of swoons in his presence. But Daphne knows the rules. She knows exactly what is sort of right on that edge. So then Nigel, with his face a complete mess now, storms up to the Bridgerton family at the picnic. And as Daphne anticipated, show his entitlement and insist upon a marriage because they went on the dark walk together. He's like Um, waving his marriage license around being all like, hello, look at my special license. And also the rumors that I'm going to start to blackmail you into marriage. As a threat, I just look at them and I go, you are a rich family that is popular, that is rich. Like you could buy any other husband for her. (laughs) And this then becomes a non-issue. But the taint of scandal wouldn't go away. Like everybody would be like they had to buy her a husband because she was impure and thus other her sisters are also suspect like it would like the threat is quite real they are too rich for me to take this seriously Antony is a viscount if they were a lower ranked family maybe but like this I just I watch it and I'm just like this is written by people who are not thinking about how easy it is to get away with shit when you've got money. We see how quick Antony is to rush to a, du- a duel as a solution when the Bridgertons are on their carriage ride home. We see Eloise's face in all its beauty and expression. But we also see Daphne accept the lumps as they've been given to her. And as a Antony apologist, he looks upset right at the end. And this is why I shouldn't listen to audiobooks at the same time as I'm watching episodes. But yes. I was going to say, you've changed your tune so dramatically from one episode to the next. I'm listening to the Count who loved me on audiobook. And now I'm just like, I must protect Anthony, who I also appreciate. (laughs) Full dick. But maybe it's because I've fallen a little bit in love with Jonathan Bailey. He can have anyway, a sheet in his eyes all he wants. It's all his fault. He doesn't have to marry Nigel Furbrook. He wanted to keep problem solving and he just took Daphne's acceptance at her word. He respected her point of view and I'm. it just bummed me out anyway. And then there's that conversation between Violet and Daphne in Daphne's bedroom and Daphne's talking about the marriage she wanted, like her mama and papa's. I might have cried a lot. <laughs> I think it was a really touch like it was a really touching scene and particularly because Violet is heartbroken too. She knows that she can't fix this for her child and she had such hopes for her child and but I think that the way that she reframes the possibilities of Daphne's life is like it's really bittersweet but I think that it's also hopeful and realistic that hope still exists that that happiness can still exist and it might not look like they both wanted but it doesn't mean that Daphne's life is over or devoid or going to be devoid of happiness going forward like it's it's a very mature conversation it silently acknowledges that she's not going to get fulfillment or love or even maybe companionship in that relationship with Nigel and she doesn't try to sugarcoat that but she doesn't also like sit in that she goes straight to what can give your life meaning where you can hide from your husband. (laughs) But 
It's even more distressing to me about Daphne's ignorance and also the incident from episode one with Nigel that it's not just entering a relationship with someone who she doesn't love. It's a relationship with someone who doesn't see her as a person. (laughs) And it's also entering a relationship with someone who's already tried to sexually assault her basically. (laughs) So it's so much darker if you sort of start peeling back the layers. Yep. Ugh. If we want to talk about an inequitable society, throughout this episode, there was a enormous presence of tobacco. And I was like, I wonder if that was sort of a little subtext of where the Bridgertons get their wealth. Oh like my the god, I didn't of the even story. think about it. Uh, yeah. I didn't think of that either. I just thought it was funny that everyone online thought snuff was cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not. She's, I mean, that means that scene would play a whole different level of weird <laughs> of the queen just snorting cocaine in front of Violet. But yeah, I think I hadn't pick that up i did like i don't know i mean i might be reading very much too much into it but i did think that there was such a heavy presence of tobacco and i know like i know that the showrunners and the writers were aware that the peerage made their money mostly in off slave plantations and tobacco was a huge yeah i can just imagine them going wouldn't it be cool if eloise was on the swings showing she's a cool person by smoking She's a rebel. Don't ruin one of my favorite things about this show. (laughs) I agree. It's a great little relationship dynamic there and makes me like Benedict so much. And I am so uncomfortable with that. Look, one of the most shocking things about this episode was that I liked Benedict, but also... (laughs) This is totally not shocking. The first time I watched that scene, I thought that it was Antony that was sitting on the swing with her. Well, white boys all tend to look alike eventually. But, I mean, this plays into the casting concerns of Pete, like a lot of fans before the show, was the siblings wouldn't look alike. At points, you can't tell Antony, Benedict and Colin apart. Adele, literally, this is what my brain does. Does he have sideburns? Nope. Does he have tall hair? Nope. Must be Benedict. (laughs) (laughs) So I just, I have to, like, just something random, because we have mentioned, like, Violet's conversation with the Queen and the Snuff. Why was the contortionist wearing fucking heels? That was so that we understand the level of, like, contrarian that the Queen was. Violet invites Lady Burbrook to tea and it turns out to be a cunning plan they clearly had rehearsed that like there was a script clearly they had talked about what the best opportunity to get the dirt and it's to do sort of the below stairs hierarchy was the best in and I thought that was a masterpiece well it sets up what becomes the thesis of the show which is how power works in a gender binary. And Mm. I think it's very much like it is a sign or a nod to the power of gossip and this function that gossip serves in keeping women as safe as possible and respecting that. Because, like, I keep kind of turning around and pointing out, like, Me Too moment kind of stuff. But Mm. this is very much a post-Me Too program because a lot of conversations in the immediate aftermath of that was about the whisper networks whisper networks and that's very much what this show is doing and it's like this is how this is how women have always kind of kept each other safe from dangerous men and that's fine but I also it's an uh, I think it's a parallel to this to the discussion about the handling of race in the show as well in that on the surface the show appears to be making quite progressive points but there isn't an underlying thoughtfulness to it that cements that point that that creates a fundamental progression I guess 
in this case, you know, the Whisper Network is, you know, women are going to talk and we're going to share information with each other. And that's how we're going to protect our daughter or each other. But it works so well and it works so quickly and it's so effective. It, it doesn't acknowledge that in a patriarchal power system, you can have the information and still get stuck. Like the thing that causes Burbrook to be kind of ostracized by everybody is that he has presumably sexually assaulted a maid in his household and no one has cared until it might have affected Daphne and her marriage prospects. Yeah. I don't want to be shitting on this show because I, like I said, I'm on my fourth watch. Like I am quite sincerely enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Like there are, there is a lot about it that I enjoy. It's just that I don't think that there's any sort of point in pretending that it doesn't have some fundamental failures. I think they do a lot of things fantastically, but there's there's a minute <laughs> fracture where it's not completely squaring itself away. And I think probably all three of us feel that. Mm. I will say, like, after after that thread of disappointment, we do go into another highlight moment of the episode, which is now is when... They dance to Sean Mendes. No, 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 no! You can't miss my. Mo- you can't skip my moment, Joe. Oh, what Please. then? What? Okay. The truth is revealed about Burbrook, and Daphne is saved. And then there's a discussion in the drawing room where Violet is before the fire, and Anthony comes to her, which is a direct flip of what happens in episode one when Violet goes to Anthony's office to talk to him about what's been going on and he is quite dismissive of her. In contrast, this is Violet's office and quote, quote fingers and Anthony is the one entering her power space. (laughs) I'm so excited. All right. (laughs) And this time she has handled shit And he knows it, but even better, above the fireplace is a portrait of Edmund, Violet, and Anthony. Anthony as a child. So not only is he getting spoken to in the shadow of his father, he's also been reduced to a child who's disappointed his parents. That was profound. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. I think they do a lot of that mirroring or callbacks and this episode, and what I haven't really found the right word for, they do a lot of that callbacks and sort of book ending of different moments. Okay, well now are we allowed to go to the ball? Now also, can we finally talk about Sean Mendes? Yeah. So this is the second of the agreed upon eight balls that they will attend together, plus the He's picnic a that they've already. Negotiator. I do love that they did have an agreement of six and then she turned around the very next time they met up and was like, actually now eight plus a picnic. And then just wins. (laughs) In my head, this is like the Valentine's ball because it's red themed. Most people are wearing red, including Simon. It's in my blood is playing and they dance chest to chest, heart to heart. So my feeling is this whole dance and this ball is showing that progression from curiosity and enjoyment at the start of the episode to burgeoning love. And then we get that confirmation when Danbury asks Simon what's wrong with him and he stutters, which means he has an emotional response to what's going on and Boy, that's great. And that's showing how the departments of this show are working together. Like, holy heck. I guess but I guess I, the that thing also is... implies that stammer is like a psychosomatic thing, which I don't particularly like. There is a beautiful moment. And I would say that it's subtle, but it's not because like it's a fucking close up frame. But like where Simon trails his fingers along Daphne's spine. (laughs) It is so deeply sensual. That's one of the things that this series 
absolutely gets right. Like it's really, really good at showing those like small but sensual moments. I read an interview with Chris Van Dusen, the showrunner, and he did reference the 2005 Pride and Prejudice where Darcy and Elizabeth touch hands and you have that moment of them touching skin to skin for the first time and then his, as everyone knows who's seen that version. The hand flex. Um, that's elemental. And the back did the same thing. I just want to move on to sort of the last scene of the episode because I really like the ball was so upbeat and hopeful and it was really lovely. Um, but the last scene sort of hit a red flag for me because Eloise comes into Daphne's room and she's all like, aren't you afraid of childbirth? Uh, you know, they clearly shared a, um, shared an experience of hearing Violet giving birth to Hyacinth. And now I'm just the teeniest, tiniest little bit afraid that they're making all of Eloise's reluctance to follow a traditional path because she's afraid of giving birth. Oh as my God, I hadn't to, that. No. As opposed to like an actual desire to be different or to achieve something different. I'm just, I mean, I don't know if it's actually going to happen, but it did sort of raise that little red flag in that conversation that maybe they're they're going to frame it as, oh, Eloise is just afraid to give birth, and that is why she doesn't want to trod oh the God. well-trod path. Anyway, I'm so sorry to end the episode on a downer. But well, no, it ends on an even that. bigger oh, downer because no, the actual I final scene is Already the bow. <laughs> All right, so final, final scene of the episode, which is yet another super depressing flashback in which we see Simon speaking perfectly clearly to his father. This is a pivotal scene where Simon articulates his reasons for not wanting to get married, and it's that he has decided to make a vow to his father, his dying father, just to kind of spite him. As someone who is like really loves pettiness, I got to respect it. I don't like it, but I respect it. It also potentially speaks to Simon's mindset that he was never going to find love or family or any, like know what that was going to be like anyway. So he hasn't lost anything. I, I do, but really I don't believe that that's actually the problem. Um, it's just another example of men not being able to sit with their feelings so they have to let their feelings explode all around everybody around them. Men will literally make a vow to never get married and to end the ducal line rather than go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Can we also talk about the inherent drama of what he did? It's so fucking dramatic. It needs like a swoosh with a cape or something. Like it's just like it's masculine drama. Like, they so are asshole. Like, it's just great. It's reminded me that there is a scene that we kind of brushed over because it's super subtle and it also, like, is not particularly interesting, except that it is. So Baby Simon, when he finally speaks to his father, talks about, I sent you all these letters to tell you how good I'm doing in school, blah, blah, blah. And explicitly asks his father, did you get them? Did you read them? And his, oh, his dad is like, I'm not wasting my time on you. And then we kind of, we flash forward to Simon being in. Cliveden at the beginning. And he yeah. has and the he finds, letters. Yeah. He finds a drawer full of letters. Are we supposed to believe that those are the letters that he, as a child, wrote to his father and his father kept all this time? I don't believe he kept he those letters. Yeah, he found, he was looking at them in Cly in his house. Which is interesting because it means that his dad never wrote back to him, which means that we may be spared the second epilogues. I guess the thing that I'm pointing out is I don't believe that his father, having received those letters and refusing to open them, actually kept them. Yeah, you, if you don't care at all, you don't put them in the same drawer time and time and time and time again. So I don't know what kind of feelings I'm meant to have about that other than, like, it's a visual way to point to 
their broken relationship, but it's <laughs> it's the kind of visual point that doesn't really work because you either have to assume that his father is not as bad as, as Simon thinks or because <laughs> Because I can't help myself, I've done the tiniest start of a reread of The Duke and I. The starkest difference is that while Book Simon's father is still very much a dick, he mourns his wife and he is actually like, that that was someone that he cared about. Maybe not particularly deeply, but like. I think I find it much more jarring because I think... The performance isn't great in The Duke. I think it's very one note and there could have been a few more levels to it. It almost plays as a caricature of a villain. Well, I think this is the like this is that sort of adaptation translation of like they've taken <laughs> what I've extrapolated is quite a nuanced character into like a very flattened, very like They've, they've given him only sort of the essentials and the essentials are we're not meant to like him, we're not meant to bond with him because he's Simon's villain, whether he is a villain or not. He exists sort yeah. of only in rage and fear and that's it. But maybe that's the point. At the end, Simon's final scene with him, he calls him a monster and maybe it's just the depiction is supposed to be... Well, he's Simon's monster, right? We only sort of mm. see him in relation to Simon, so... There is no nuance in how Simon thinks about his father, so there's yeah. no nuance in the character. So basically we've talked ourselves around into being like, okay. Anyway, I think now it's time for... What would them we do? In this section, we hear from a lovelorn character from another book who needs advice from the ever-stylish and ever-sage Lady Danbury. Last episode, we put the call out for you to send us your questions as thinly veiled book recommendations and in truly delightful news, you've responded. This week, we hear from Debbie Malik from Alicia Rye's contemporary romance, Glutton for Pleasure. She writes, Dear Lady Danbury, I am in a bit of what you would call a pickle. In two pickles, even. It's been a while between dates, and when the hottest guy to ever frequent my restaurant expressed interest, I wasn't going to turn it down, even when he brought his equally hot twin brother along. It was only supposed to be one night of debauchery with Jason Marcus. It's turned into endless nights, and I think I'm falling for both of them. But I can't exactly bring two guys home, not to my conservative Desi mum anyway. But I can't choose between one or the other. They're like two halves of the one whole. What would Danbury do? No, no, I have a twin cest question. All for threesome. But do the twins touch each other? And does that just make it masturbation because they have the same DNA profile? They're still different autonomous beings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, like, the idea of, like, good point. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt to tell you the most ridiculous... Because I... When I was in high school, I was very close friends with twins. Another one of my friends, she asked, do you ever get up in the morning and just like forget which one you are? Because she couldn't tell them apart. She thought maybe that was something that also happened with them. (laughs) And so Adele, that's what your question just made me think of. Here's what she should do. So they're twins, right? Yes. Identical. Yes. So she doesn't have to bring both of them home to her family. She can just bring one of them at a time. Plus, benefit for the twins, they only have to go hang out at the in-laws like only 50% of the time. Can I just talk about how unfair it must be to identical, like identical twins that people have fantasies about being a twin sandwich or whatever like I uh, it's not a fantasy I've had is it a fantasy that you guys have had no but I've read this book and I liked this book I haven't read this book but I don't think that there are a lot of authors that I would trust to handle this book other than maybe Alicia Rye like I trust her to handle it I'm trying to remember now I know that the twins don't have penetrative sex with each other I know that but I don't know if they touch each other at all. 
Look, I think what Lady Danbury would say is, get it, girl. Live your best life. Yeah. But be aware that you are making choices right now that people are going to judge the hell out of. And there are going to be a lot of questions. And you need to go ahead and figure out whether this amazing sex and potential squishy feelings are going to balance out having constant speculation about your relationship and whether you'll be like you know what maybe i actually want an easier future and i'm just going to enjoy this in the short term and if you ever decide to have a family you know that they're both the father yeah hey that's that hey that is a actual benefit to being in a threesome with twins as opposed to unrelated guys i guess that (laughs) The only extra bit of advice that I would add is to decide together on what your boundaries are about what questions you will answer, because you don't actually owe most people an explanation. If you want to lie, you're allowed to lie. If you don't want to have to lie, you also don't have to do that. But make a decision together if you decide to commit to these two men make sure that communication is at the center of your relationship because you are going to be facing some challenges so this recommendation came from my formerly sixth best friend sophie (laughs) (laughs) the reason that she chose glutton for pleasure by alicia rye is that it's hot and fun and she wanted to see this adapted by netflix Look, I mean, dream big, Sophie. (laughs) If you, like Sophie, want to send us your book recommendations in the form of a letter to Lady Danbury, record a voicemail and send it to us at our Gmail account, which I definitely know the name of. BridgertonPod at gmail.com. Don't worry if you don't get a clean take because I'm happy to edit. She's very happy to edit. Trust us. She edits me all the time. (laughs) (laughs) That's all for this episode of What Would Danbury Do? We'll be back in a fortnight to discuss episode three, The Art of the Swoon. We've had to change our Instagram, so you can now find us there at WWDDPod. You can still find us on Twitter at BridgertonPod, or send us an email at BridgertonPod at gmail.com, or join the conversation online, hashtag WWDDPod. This episode was recorded on the traditional and unceded land of the Gadigal, Wurundjeri, and Boon Wurrung people, and edited by audio producer Rudy Bremer on Gadigal Country. Thanks for listening, and remember... WWDD. What Would Danbury Do is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. <laughs>